Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we are uh, pleased to have uh, Dr. Yi Zhao Yang today here visiting from the University of Oregon. She is our visiting scholar and will be here today and tomorrow. So uh, after uh, today's uh, presentation on green urbanism, China's uh, Road to Energy and Environmental Stability, uh, she will also be uh, presenting tomorrow evening in the Hudson Auditorium on sustainable urban transportation in China, problems, challenges, and solutions. And uh, prior to that presentation, which is at 7 p.m. tomorrow, there'll be a reception with food, free food. <laughs> so please come uh, uh, tomorrow evening as well. Uh, my thanks to the Visiting Scholars Program here, uh, which has enabled us uh, to bring Dr. Yang here from Oregon. I've already expressed our sympathies to her on the, the fall, not, not just of, um, well, KU, unfortunately, but University of Oregon also had a disappointing day yesterday. But she says she doesn't really care. <laughs> Uh, to take my glasses off here. Uh, Dr. Yang is Associate Professor at the University of Oregon in, in Eugene, and uh, she is Interim Program Director of the Master of Community and Regional Planning Program, and Associate Professor in the Department of Planning, Public Policy and Management. Uh, she has uh, degrees in architecture and building science from Tianjin University in China. And uh, she has her PhD in city and regional planning from Cornell University here in the States. Uh, she's interested in environment people relationships, uh, using residential satisfaction and perception to evaluate impacts of land use. Uh, environment uh, behavior uh, relationships, understanding the impacts of built environment on people's behavior, and understanding how placemaking knowledge and practices can be transferable between different cultures and countries. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, please give her a warm welcome. I have this on me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me. And good morning. Um, it's it's really a, a good opportunity for me to come here to share some of my uh, research. Um, as Tom just described, my main area of study and research is on how environment affects people's behavior. And then actually, I did my dissertation on primarily focusing on the study in the U.S. And then some of the research that related to sustainability, particularly sustainability practices in China, is kind of a, came out of my most recent research activities. So um, I don't pretend I'm a expert, an expert on this area. I really come here, try to share with you some of my recent learnings. So I'm a, I'm a student, definitely, in this area. Okay. So um, the title of my uh, presentation today is called Urban, Green Urbanism. China's road to energy and environmental sustainability uh, really is more focused on the energy part. Uh, but we know the energy consumption is really double-sided sword and resource consumption and waste generation. So that's why um, I have both energy and environment sustainability mentioned here. Um, so just give you a kind of an outline of what I will be talking about. So the presentation will have four parts. I'll begin discussing uh, China's energy challenges. So really some statistics, uh, uh, some discussion about uh, the China's rapid increase in uh, energy consumption and then the you know, projected continued growth and then the imbalance between the production and supply and then the challenge that China needs to address. Um, and then the second part, I will be talking about the general approaches uh, China as a 
centralized, top-down, planned economy. Uh, this government, this country, how it uses to address uh, energy issues. Uh, and then the third part uh, is what you know, my argument is. Uh, so in addition to the energy efficiency uh, measures, in addition to the uh, supply of renewable energies, China really need to use green urbanism to systematically apply a lot of the measures and solutions to energy uh, issue, particularly using new green urbanism to address uh, uh, energy demand, uh, transportation demand issues. So I will be talking about green buildings in China, public transportation, and eco cities. And I'll conclude with brief discussion about the challenges and new uh, opportunities that China is facing. So before I get into the um, you know, statistics and things related to this topic, I just want to give you a pretty brief introduction about China. I know uh, maybe quite a few of you have gone to China, uh, but just to give you some background. So, um, so this is a map of China. Uh, I use this uh, more of administrative divisions and then uh, showing 33 provinces four municipalities, which is what we call, also call centrally controlled or centrally administrative cities. That's Beijing, Tianjin, Shanghai, and Chongqing. And there are two special administrative region, regions, which very hard to see. That's just Hong Kong and Macau, and five autonomous regions. And also administratively, China is actually then subdivided all the three, 33 provincial level regions further subdivided into prefectural level regions. Uh, we have prefectural level cities. We have prefectural level, uh, just called districts. So there are 333 of them. And then far below that, then we have counties and townships and re uh, township level districts or regions. Um, I want to emphasize on this prefectural level regions, sometimes we call cities in China which is really a much larger geographic area than what you can think of cities in the US. So uh, in China, a city generally contain a, a continuously built up urban core, and also it uh, manages surrounding counties, which is more, more or less a rural area. So when we talk about a city, particularly prefectural level city, uh, it, we're talking about municipal, which uh, manages much larger area, extending beyond to the already built up uh, urban area. And this has a very important implication in terms of transportation planning, transportation management, because you have a, basically have a regional government that uh, is at a good uh, position to manage regional level uh, economic development and then spatial planning, particularly when it's related to transportation. Okay, so that's kind of a general background. And I want to highlight this map. Ooh, sorry, I think I got stuck here. I need to juggle two computers, so sometimes I forgot which one. So this, that's the uh, prefectural level city, prefectural region. So all the boundary area you can see here. These are, we call prefectural city. And sometimes you hear we talk about city of Chengdu, city of Xi'an, which is a regional city that governs rural area and the urban core. Okay. So this is a map that shows very uneven distribution of population and economic activities in China. Um, in the 1920s, a economic geographer identified this line, which connects Mohe, which is almost the northern end of China, and then Tengchong. If you connect these two, city, two uh, cities uh, using a um, direct line, which forms a 45 angle street line, pretty much splits China into two parts. So each part would have very similar area size. Uh, but in the um, <coughs> east part of this line, almost the entire country's population, close to 95%, reside in this part. And then this part only have about 5% of the population. So you can see it's a very, very uneven distribution. This is, is because of uh, natural kind of geographic uh, reasons, there's also historic uh, reason why economic activities mainly 
um, concentrated in this area. So you can also see why the major The major cities located mainly, if you can still see that line, is in the uh, east part of that line. And then here is the three major economic development region. This is the Yangtze uh, uh, Delta region, and then the Pearl River Delta region, and then this is the Bohai uh, region. This is the three main economic development zone. So let's get into the first part. Um, every time we talk about China, the, the first thing people start talking about is fat growth. It's economic growth, uh, it's GDP increase. So China's sustained economic growth has been uh, uh, considered as a miracle. So uh, from 19, late, early 1980s all the way to uh, 2012, China, China has sustained very robust economic uh, development, and uh, it has maintained a GDP growth on average annually of 9.08. And the number, think about uh, US and other Western countries, if you get three or four percent, you'll be very happy. But China has maintained that very robust growth for so many years, uh, even though recently that growth is uh, kind of a, a, a slower pace, it's still it's projected at seven or eight percent. So also this map shows as the GDP grow going on, there is this red line is China's total energy consumption. It almost kept kept the pace of the economic development. Not just the amount of the growth uh, of energy consumption. Um, this actually has government worry because of the imbalance of what China can itself produce or supply in terms of energy. But what it needs to sustain its economic growth means it has to import more and more ener energy from outside. And that caused this worry about the security issue. So just give you some uh, statistic numbers. Uh, within 30 years, um, China's total energy com consumption grew by five times. And then particularly three areas, uh, coal consumption, uh, oil consumption, and then natural gas. It's, uh, China has become the world largest consumers of coal and then uh, oil is only second to the US. And it's projected to grow uh, to surpass US in the next 10 years. So, um, but in the meantime, China also has boosted its own energy production, but it's not could not keep up with its own energy demand. So here it's two um, maps showing China's own energy production in oil and natural gas. Um, oil probably is the best example showing this imbalance between China's uh, supply and consumption, and also indicating the threat that how much China uh, uh, reliance China has to uh, have on the uh, import of uh, these resources. So there's um, also this growing gap, it's projected to even become um, larger. Gas dependence and oil uh, import dependence is all getting uh, heavier. So by 2035, China will be the largest energy importer in the world, surpass uh, US. Okay, so um, energy consumption itself already has government worried. Uh, because of many, uh, the national security issue, um, there's also other, and then we can see that the first slide shows that energy consumption and demand rise, uh, main part is uh, because caused by continuous economic growth. Um, not only uh, that's energy issue that uh, has economic growth, is, as economic growth is externality, there are other things that we don't focus on here today, but you probably get to see that, or read that from um, media and then understand uh, how serious the situation is in China. So environment degradation, 
pollution, air pollution, water pollution, this is a very serious problem. Loss of agricultural land. China needs to feed. China only has 4% of uh, agricultural land in the world, but it has to feed about 22 to 23% of popu world population. So that's another major issue that Chinese government worry about. Depletion of natural resources. Just like the map, we show that even though China has almost the second or uh, third largest area of land nation, uh, worldwide, but because of natural uh, kind of a desirable inhabitable uh, natural environment all only covers only part of the country. So its natural resource is not uh, rich, particularly on a per capita uh, basis. And also the economic growth bringing rising inequality and social segregation. So basically in Ch China has this big gap in terms of its uh, consumption and then waste generation, so that translated into ecological footprint. So according to a worldwide fund, uh, by 2007, China's per capita ecologic footprint was two times greater than its available biocapacity. And that biocapacity deficit is growing. By, uh, <coughs> according to WWF, uh, if China has to continue its uh, standard of living in 2007, we will, we will need more than one Earth just to sustain the kind of life quality or lifestyle that Chinese um, society is pursuing. And globally, if this trend continues, in terms of energy consumption, in terms of uh, all the um, uh, waste generation, resource deple depletion, by 2020, uh, we will need two Earths to um, sustain the kind of lifestyle uh, we want. So um, China is aware of the problem, and then the government is really aggressive in pursuing uh, solutions, particularly to the energy issues. Uh, environment um, protection is another topic area that I'm not, I don't have to touch upon, uh, but that's also an area that government is very aggressive trying to address. So uh, taking actions. The government has identified three areas that they need to work hard in order to address the energy issue, the challenges. So first is improving energy efficiency. So lots of China's industry, uh, China's um, transportation sector, the energy intensity is very high. It's kind of uh, the... So, um, which means, in order to uh, produce per, uh, one unit of GDP, China consumes more energy than the rest of the world. So improving energy is the kind of the first thing to do, trying to achieve energy savings and then reduce energy consumption. And the second area that government has put a lot of effort and in, uh, investment is uh, renewable energy sources. China has taken strategically taking a uh, leadership position wants to uh, involve, invest in this uh, industry area, and China has made actually a great success that we'll be talking about. And finally, um, reducing demand, that's actually getting to the source of the energy issue. Um, regardless how much you can save, how much you can conserve, if the uh, demand keep rising, if uh, because of China is now facing rising uh, income, and then people are uh, trying to pursue more comfortable lifestyle. If the demand is not being tamed, uh, we still will face this energy uh, challenges. So um, in the context of China as a centralized, uh, very planned economy, uh, government in all this area seems to take uh, approaches that's dominated by the centrally devised laws, regulations, mandates, policies, targets, and goals, and then followed by actions uh, that inc include economic restructuring, industry upgrading, heavy technology uh, investment, and then using demonstration, research, and education to disseminate new technology and new practices, and then uh, finally also rely on some of the market mechanism and consumer behavior to uh, help address the issues. 
So I list all these items here. This is kind of a systematically this China's approach or style of addressing issue is top down, having got central government uh, uh, set targets and goals, but the market mechanism relying, relies on market mechanism and also understanding the consumer behavior, that's the least developed. And I think that's the part that China really needs to uh, uh, make improvements. Yeah, all these areas, actions, are targeted to these main um, uh, three approaches. Okay, so let's talk about energy efficiency. Um, improve energy efficiency as a national goal has been uh, widely accepted. And then when we talk about China's national goals and targets, one document or a series of documents become the most important that you need to consider. This is what we call the five-year plan. Um, the five-year plan started in 1953. It basically is a um, kind of a centrally controlled uh, plant economy. Use this plan to out make a um, um, roadmap or outline its development strategies, development principles, and um, so. It's using this plan to outline countries' economic development principles and goals. It sets targets, goals, launches government strategies and initiatives. And then the measures and the goals targets set in the plans have very deep impacts on government spending, policy, programs and regulations, business landscapes, and then public service deliveries. Um, it's very interesting, China, since 1953, started its first five-year plan, FYP. And, but environmental related issues was not, were not included in the FYPs until the 10th FYP, which, cover, which covers the year 2001 to 2005. And also the very energy specific uh, um, items, goals, and initiatives only started being uh, included in the last two recent FYPs, so the 11th and 12th, which governs 2006, 2010, 2011, 2015. And specifically, there are three things in these two five-year plans that's a very explicitly targeted toward energy issues. So first is setting energy saving goals and targets. So for example, in the 11th uh, five-year plan, the government said nationwide in the next five years from 2006 to 2010, the country will achieve 20% cut in energy intensity. That's a very, very aggressive goal. And then in the next five-year plan, additional 16% uh, target was set. So in addition, so what this means is once the government set this, uh, this goal, and then it, the um, target then distributed among different industries and also distributed into different pr provinces, provinces, prefecture city levels, and all the way down to the counties or even village levels, so everybody now has a goal they need to achieve, and they, need, they will be evaluated by the end of this five year, five year. So besides setting the goals and targets, there's also uh, investment, heavy investment in energy efficiency improvement technology and practices. So specifically in the 11th five year plan, the government um, designated a billion dollar into uh, uh, top 10 areas where it considers key projects can bring in technology uh, that has energy efficiency improvement potential. Um, continue on that in the 12th uh, five-year plan, which actually just finished this year, and then right now the 13th FYP is being developed as we we're talking. Uh, so the 12th five-year plan further guide the country in terms of industrial upgrading and restructuring. And all this has implication or target on energy efficiency, uh, improvement, and energy savings. So um, this is the, in the 11th five-year plan, uh, the national investment in technological improvements. They identified 10 key projects or can can, uh, 10 key areas. Um, it covers several main categories, such as renovating coal-fired uh, industrial boiler, 
combined uh, heat and power system in urban areas and uh, um, targeting industries, energy improvements, as well as residential and government energy use. And it also includes specific industries like green lighting. So um, government set aside $1 billion for enterprise to apply for government funding to integrate new technology into their production. Um, most often, they get up to 60% of their project capital cost covered in front. And then the government requires all the uh, industries to go through comprehensive uh, energy audit. And then once it's con approved, uh, certified as being successful, and also have the uh, technology installed uh, and implemented, it will receive the 40% remaining funds. And then the government also provides uh, awards, financial awards, if it considers um, the uh, uh, technology application is very successful. Um, continue with sort of a national level setting targets and goals. Uh, the 12 five year plan specifically identified seven strategic emerging industries. And you can see here the energy saving uh, environment protection industry, the new energy auto uh, industry. This is all considered as pillar industries in the next uh, uh, five year or even 10 to 12, 15 years uh, national economic development. What this means is there will be heavy uh, uh, government investment target in those industries. Um, and then the five -year, 12 five year plan even specifically established GDP targets for these uh, strategic emerging industries. It wants by 2015, 8% of it, though all these industries could contribute to 8% of GDP. And by 2020, that percentage needs to go up to 15%. So this is all very, very aggressive uh, government initiatives and then actions. And what's the result? And uh, China's energy intensity has dropped dramatically. If you do, use the word uh, energy intensity uh, change as reference, you can see that even though China's energy intensity is still much, much higher uh, than the world average, but that progress is very clear. So from uh, 1980 to 2010, within 30 years, China's uh, energy intensity has declined by 70%. Um, if you remember, in the 11th five-year plan, there was a target to cut energy intensity by 20%. And actually, by the end of 2010, that five-year, there, there was 19.6% of cut or decline in energy intensity. So government was very proud that they have reached these goals. So the next area that government wants to make investment to address energy issue is investing renewable energy as a national strategy. So within both five-year plans, the most recent two, renewable energy um, has been explicitly identified and then uh, very specific target and goals has been set. So for example, China wants its renewable energy share as its total energy uh, production uh, by 2015 to reach 11.4% and then 15% by 2020, and then even double that per, uh, share within uh, in 10 years later. Um, because of a national strategy and uh, set in the uh, 12th, 11th and 12th five-year plans, there are also followed up many laws and then long uh, uh, plan, energy development plan, plans, and uh, uh, all those plans outline additional strategies the government will be taking uh, to boost its uh, new energy sector. So for example, uh, it plans to invest 761 billion US dollars in new energy sector and building seven large scale wind bases in six, six provinces and provides very strong incentives for rural solar installations. And it has a golden sun program that provides large amount of subsidies for um, solar installations in rural areas. So um, in this part, technology and investment, China has 
firmly established is as a leader in clean tech technology, and then we'll keep high investment to keep that leadership. So in hydro electricity, wind turbines, and uh, solar, uh, solar PV cells, China has demonstrated its capacity to be uh, uh, industry leaders in this area. And also, um, solar water heaters, China now counts for, um, produce about 70, 70 to 80 percent of the global market for solar hot water system. And then it has installed uh, 42 million square meters of solar water heaters in just in 2009 alone. And alternative energy um, vehicle industries has also received very heavy government investment. And the plan is to invest uh, 100 billion RMB in the next 10 years. And with all the new energies, China is also poised to upgrade its uh, energy grid to uh, best take advantage of its technology output. So this is um, just some pictures showing the new uh, clean technologies applications uh, installation in China. So the result is quite impressive. China has, um, if you look at over the years, China's clean um, or renewable, clean uh, energy source mainly focus on the hydro uh, power. And then hydro power, wind and solar uh, uh, power sources, China has established as the world largest um, installation and also generation capacity. So um, China's uh, water, wind, and solar sources generated about 20% of world electricity, which is greater than Fran France and Germany combined together in terms of generating capacity. So that's another kind of a successful story. But there's still, there's cha uh, still challenges ahead. So just relying on these two areas, energy improvement and then uh, clean energy or re, uh, alternative energy supply increase still not, will not be uh, sufficient to help China address its energy issues. Um, most of the energy efficiency improvements have been achieved by what we call low-hanging fruits. Uh, so it's shutting down uh, outdated power plants, upgrading outdated power plants, or improving efficiency of industrial producers and um, Largest Chinese company right now, their energy intensity has more or less reached uh, world uh, standards. So it's very hard now to actually reach high level of energy uh, efficiency improvement. And also for the uh, clean energy uh, supply side, uh, most of the renewable energy re still requires very, very heavy government subsidies to be operatable. Uh, and the renewable energy are not still very reliable sometimes it requires um, the fuel-powered plants as backup to meet uh, peak demand. So um, and the third part is the growing demand. China has not been very successful to address this growing demand, particularly coming from transportation sector and then under, uh, building operation sectors. So the rising wealth, the motorization of Chinese cities, this is, poses very huge threats to China's um, energy sufficiency and sustainability. So that brings to the third part of uh, my presentation. So I kind of use green urbanism as a place-making practices, as a way of urbanization to talk about how we can use uh, green urbanism to address energy supply, demand, and efficiency. So we're coming back to the um, slides you, you saw earlier. Um, so in a way, China is experiencing three things all to simultaneously, which is very rare. So it's, it's, under, it's undergoing industrialization. It's undergoing modernization. And also, it's undergoing very massive urbanization. So these three things are together 
actually gives China a very unique opportunity to integrate green technology, to integrate um, green growth, green economic growth into its urban development. So that's what I call urban, uh, green urbanism. So uh, green urbanism, and simply speaking, you can consider it as building human habitat that mutually benefits the human being, human society, and in the natural environment by imposing the min minimum impact uh, and by uh, take, you know, uh, taking care of the uh, natural environment. So the green urbanism has the potential of addressing economy, placemaking, and lifestyle. Um, before getting into the um, green urbanism that I will be talking about, the green buildings, um, China's public transportation, and uh, eco-city building, um, I want to give you some background about uh, China's ur rapid urbanization. So China has gone through, uh, particularly in the last two decades, very rapid urban growth. Um, its urbanization increased from 23% to 50%. Um, US is now stand as about 80% urbanization rate, which means the per percentage or proportion of total population who reside in the cities or urban areas. Um, the num because of this, in the last 25 years, 300 million rural population have migrated to cities. And this is, this is basically 100 Oregon population have moved. Uh, so you can just kind of give you a sense of how big that migration is. Um, this is in, indeed the largest human migration in history, and it will continue um, in, at this almost a similar, if not faster, pace. Um, as a result, Chinese cities have increased in numbers, has increased in its physical size, and increased its population size. So um, just some numbers, you see that uh, continue following that rapid trend, in the next decade, urban population will increase by 15 million annually. And then there will be about more than 340 cities will have population over half a million just within the next 10 years. And China's urbanization is likely to reach 59 uh, by 2025, 20, and then it's going to reach by 70% in 2050. These numbers, you may think is, uh, um, is not a kind of a magically drawn up number. It's partly uh, by design. It's partly driven by economic development. So in all the FYP we talk about, each FYP actually designates, identify urbanization targets. And they want, the central government wants to achieve this level of, of urbanization because it recognizes urban development as economic drive. It is the only way to actually leave the whole country in terms of people's quality of life, in terms of accumulating enough wealth to then come back, address a lot of the environment issues. So um, as population move into the uh, cities, in tandem with that is a large building construction and then heavy uh, expansion of built environment to accommodate that population growth. So new buildings of more than 30 billion square meters of floor space will be built. Think about 50,000 50, new high-rise residential buildings will be built just to accommodate that population growth. And 170 new mass transit system. We're talking about subways, a light rail system that needs to be built just to make uh, the cities function. Also give you some idea of how Chinese cities are expanding. So this is city of Beijing in 50 years from this size, it kind of a built up all the way from here. So um, it almost double its physical size. This is city of Chengdu, um, also experienced very rapid population growth and also uh, physical expansion. But interesting enough, m lots of Chinese cities, their physical expansion actually outpaces the uh, rate of their population growth, meaning that the cities need to do better work in terms of contain this uh, uh, physical expansion. 
Okay, so understanding this massive growth uh, of Chinese cities, let's talk about the major aspect of urban development that affect energy demand and kind of uh, uh, have implications on energy um, issues. So buildings, um, we just talk about huge floor uh, space will need to be built, um, large amount of non buildings will need to be built. In China, the buildings accounts for 30% of final energy consum consumed, and then that percentage is still rising. So this is a, a good opportunity to uh, consider green building technology and green building standards uh, to achieve energy savings and efficiency improvement. In transportation, um, in China, transportation accounts for 20% of final energy consumed and because of the fast growing cars, number of cars in China, transportation has been the major contributor to the oil consumption growth in China. General land use and development patterns affect energy intensity. So when you build cities more compact, uh, um, of higher density, and then consider mixed land uses in a spatial structure, that could uh, cut down the heating needs that could allow more efficient energy uses. So that, that affects energy intensity. And lastly, how people live, what the kind of lifestyle they choose, has great impact on energy demand and savings. So I'll be talking about mainly the three things, buildings, transportation, and then land use and development patterns that systematically be considered in eco-city building in China. Um, so this is a map showing how fast China, um, China is building new buildings. Um, the blue line is the building stock, existing building stock. And then the new buildings is the purple one. So you see majority, almost like 80% of buildings in China, any time you go to visit, they are new buildings. They're just built recently. So that's because of this fast growing of cities. Um, China's building state, is the, and then projection is that China's building stock will increase three times within 20 years to 700 billion square meters. And 95% of the existing buildings do not comply to a current building energy design standard, standards. So you, even though they're building fast, but they're not building the buildings uh, to con with consideration of energy efficiency. Despite the fact that government has um, enacted building energy design standards, um, but that has not been systematically enforced and applied. So addressing the building energy efficiency issue, just like uh, I just discussed the, the general approach that government address energy uh, issues in other area, it's all start from the national government setting up codes and standards. So um, national building codes and green building ventures that China has taken include um, setting up mandatory building efficiency standards. Um, the goal is ask, uh, to request all buildings that's built um, in the next 10 or 15 years to improve their energy efficiency compared to the 1980 standards by saving by 30%, 50%, or 65%. As the year goes by, that energy savings getting more and more aggressive. The other part is reform existing buildings, retrofitting existing buildings, energy efficiency, to improve energy efficiency levels. In addition to have mandatory uh, building codes and design standards, China started to implement, develop its own green building rating standards. Probably most of you have heard about LEED, a uh, green building uh, standard that's uh, developed in the US. And China launched its own green building rating standard in 2006 and started a very aggressive green building labeling system, a rating program in 2007. Uh, compared to the mandatory, as um, building codes, this is a voluntary program. Its goal is to support national implementation of its building efficiency standards, and by providing incentives, 
and by providing recognitions that encourage market entry of environmentally sustainable green buildings. And then also has uh, using public uh, uh, projects to be, uh, demonstrate the uh, success of the green building programs. And again, um, national uh, plans designate, set, set goals and targets uh, in the 12 to five year plan and it's required that 80% of new large public buildings needs to have a green building label. The GBEL is a green building uh, design label that needs to meet that uh, rating. And many cities have since adopted more aggressive targets to demonstrate their commitment to uh, green building development. So um, <clears throat> here is very simple kind of brief introduction of China's green building rating and labeling system. So it has two rating standards, one for residential building, one for public buildings. Public building also include commercial buildings and it has two level of two labels. One is targeted uh, the design stage of building uh, uh, performance. The other is after building has been built and then evaluate its operation and uh, giving operational kind of a green building labels. And both systems are, we call the three star systems. So the rating system basically set up six areas that each project needs to meet minimum standard or requirements considering land use, outdoor environment, energy efficiency certainly is one of the big <clears throat> consideration. Water efficiency, resource efficiency, uh, indoor environment that uh, evaluate the comfort level that a building could provide to its uh, users and operational management. So <clears throat> the way how the uh, green uh, label is uh, designated Is, uh, by de is determined by the minimum scores for each of the six components, that how many minim uh, minimum scores that each project can get. So a building m must meet a minimum number of requirements in all six categories to qualify for a specific rating. So here I put an example of how um, energy efficient items can be used to rate a green building's performance. <clears throat> Meet mandatory items, you can get one star. Uh, if you want to get two stars or three stars, you have to meet additional requirements. So, and then this is criteria for uh, residential buildings and then compared to for public buildings. They are similar, but each has different you know, but, um, criteria elements. So um, as the government put emphasize on green building development and particularly develop its own green building labeling system, the growth of green building projects in China is also rise fast. Almost done. Oh, okay, I need to go fast now. <laughs> All right, let's, so this is green buildings uh, growth and then some of the green building projects, this is uh, one of the famous ones called Shanghai Center. Uh, but there are also barriers to green building development that I have outlined as uh, the four items. So, so this is a major component of transport uh, energy consumption. That's the transportation, the transport. Uh, you see that um, just within uh, 15 years, the energy consumption for the transport sector rose by uh, 3.5 times. And particularly the oil is by far the largest uh, growth in terms of energy consumption by uh, and, uh, transport sectors. Um, and then this is partly because of the way uh, cars, increase in number of cars. China's uh, um, car population will exceed the uh, car population in the US in the next five to 10 years, and it will soon become 
the country owns the most cars in the world. Travel demand management needs to be considered in order to address energy issues. Particularly in China, it's using public transportation, integration of transportation, with, uh, transportation planning with urban planning, and then uh, improve urban environment for uh, pedestrians and cyclists using the three components to address travel demand management. The first one, the public transportation, is the emphasis I want to talk, and that's the kind of a success uh, for stories that China can tell. But the last, the uh, environment uh, quality, I think China has a long way to go in terms of for pedestrian. So I want to talk about two public transportation. One is a railway transport. The other is, so this is more like the long distance interurban transportation. And there's a, a medium or shorter distance that's intra-urban transportation. So again, nationally, there is uh, FYP set goals. Uh, national high-speed rail network, now China has the largest high-speed rail network in the world, even though it only started seven years ago. Um, so this is a map showing China's um, high-speed rail network. When we talk about high-speed, is the train speed can reach 250 kilometers per hour. Um, China is building and world's longest single line. Uh, heavy, it has world's heavily most heavily used uh, network, and then it's establishing in kind of the backbones of its HRV uh, HSR network. We call it a, a four east west lines and four south uh, north south lines. It's basically is developing a network connecting all major cities in China. And then the result is quite remarkable. So this is a ridership, uh, uh, railway ridership. And then you can see only seven years, the ridership has, has increased dramatically. But at the same time, China, uh, the energy consumption of the rail transport actually declined um, because of the higher capacity, because of uh, the, um, uh, the use of uh, clean energy, most of the, the high-speed rail is uh, electrified uh, trains, um, and then because of its operation, get more uh, intelligent bases. So this is, so the next part is urban rail transit in China. This is China's uh, the intra-urban uh, transportation. The cities need to meet certain standards in order to develop urban trail. Uh, urban rail transit system. That includes subways and light rails. This is current um, cities. By year 2014, 22 to 27 cities have uh, urban rail system with mileage of 2,000 miles in total. And then by year 2020, 40 cities will have urban, uh, like subways and light rails. So that's how it's distributed. Public bus system um, is also given high priority. And China is developing very rapidly dedicated bus corridor in name of bus uh, rapid transit. And bike as a green transportation has been uh, recognized. China still has the most number of bikes, six million, 600 million bikes, even though the share of using bike to do Travel, trans travel has to decline dramatically. So some cities, uh, uh, led by city of Hangzhou, is using public bike share pro programs trying to encourage uh, the use of bikes and bring back the uh, bike culture in China. Um, eco cities is a way of systematically using all the uh, methods of green urbanism we discussed. And then from site selection, industrial selection, a green transportation, all the issues that we, we see have energy implications can be simultaneously and systematic addressed in eco-city building. And China is building very rapidly eco-cities. This is a new cities that built outside the existing uh, city periphery that demonstrate um, kind of the principles of uh, green urbanism. So I want to give you two examples they are both very large scale government supported eco cities. One is the Sino Singapore Tianjin Eco City. Um, it's a very ambitious project, almost completed. Um, 
it's supposed to plant for a population of 350,000 people. Um, and then it's expected to promote clean energy, promote green healthy lifestyle, and then create uh, natural harmonious and livable human habitat. Um, this is what, it, when they are designed this uh, eco city, the things they have considered, um, green transportation, green building, green economy. So everything has been addressed simultaneously when the uh, eco city are planned and then are designed. Another example is Taofidia International Eco City. This is built in the city of Changshan. It's also a large scale, very ambitious project. And then it's using um, very innovative indicator system to trying to make sure the uh, plans and the construction development meet uh, a green energy uh, sustainability goals. So for example, we consider transportation, it requires the plan to be made such that 80% of residents are within 300 meters to bus stops, 100% 100, 100 uh, of the re residential areas within 800 meters to a uh, metro or bus stop. And then it's ambitiously estimated that trip generated by automobile will be less than 10%. And then all residential districts have uh, real access. And also in building a development plan stage, consider energy plan requires the use of locally available energy sources. Um, this is a map I made a couple years ago. I think it needs to be updated. So this actually outlined all the um, major eco cities. I, I identified them because all of them has, all of them have the involvement of foreign investment and foreign companies in terms of its technological uh, um, implica applications. Not, and then you can see that they're heavily um, clustered in that three economic development zone that's identified by the national uh, plans. Okay, so the last part, um, there's still lots of improvements. We talk about successful stories, but China still faces challenges. Uh, the problem of one size fits all, uh, this tendency of design a standards nationally devised and then apply them uh, widely across the country is really problematic. Um, an anecdotal story was um, in the uh, province of Gansu, uh, a realistic estimate of its energy intensity cut can, could only be 2% in that five-year plan, five-year period. But the government wants to 20% intensity cut, and that's uniformly kind of assigned to all provinces. So a lot of the local governments end up having doing things that's kind of a very dramatic. So they cut down short power supply to hospitals, cut down power supplies to residential areas just for the purpose of energy savings so that they can achieve national targets. So um, this, that's a very serious issue that needs to be addressed. And also the top-down approach really lacks inclusion of all stakeholders. So there's no very well understanding of the consumer attitudes, preferences, and there's no uh, good research on how the industries, entities react to uh, government <coughs> and enacted standards and, and um, guidelines. Also, the, there's lack of rigorous risk assessment and the performance evaluation. Um, a lot of the implementation of those projects is largely learn by doing. So for, for example, a lot of the uh, heavy uh, urban rail projects, they're, they are not made or decided based on adequate scientific analysis. And the project review process lacks adequate consideration of all options. So mostly, success just, success just means get it built. There is no very clear uh, uh, standard of what constitutes a successful or uh, satisfactory, satisfactory outcome. So a um, lot of this is still an you know, area in good um, uh, stage that China needs to learn in terms of generate population, uh, conduct evidence-based decision-making, and just to create, uh, encourage information sharing 
uh, conduct best practice research, um, and then increase technical competencies in using advanced tech, uh, uh, analytical modeling. So, but there are opportunities for China to pursue and then continue its successful stories. First of all, the national strategies recognize urbanization and green growth can take place simultaneously, and then they recognize it's necessary that these two need to be combined. And also, China has a demographic basis and has existing urban conditions that support uh, a lot of the green urbanism development. So China has sufficient population density, China has sufficient existing infrastructure to support this kind of a, a, a heavy transportation uh, uh, infrastructure development, which makes China at a very good position to continue pursuing urban, uh, green urbanism as a way to address its energy and environment sustainability issues. That concludes my presentation. Sorry, it took me long. Couldn't see the time. Yeah, yeah. Any questions? Besides well, that, you had uh, um, it, it was a map with the uh, abandoned and, yeah. uh, and the eco cities. Mm -hmm. Why are there so many abandoned eco cities? Yeah. And what does that mean? So, um, this is a whole issue of uh, the planning and the decision making process did not rely on good information and scientific analysis. And then there's also political reasons for some of these abandoned projects have took place. So for example, you probably have heard about Shanghai as a Dongtan Eco City project. That's a high profile project that's received a lot of uh, media attention. Uh, I think right around 2005 and 2006 uh, time. But that project actually didn't pursue, even though they spent million dollars just to make a plan uh, and collaborating with AURP. Um, the reason for that is the plan making process did not consider the location of the site. The site is actually chosen in the prime uh, environmentally sensitive area, which the National Land Bureau refused to uh, allocate the land for the develop development. That's one reason. The other reason is there is involved political scandal and corruption. And then the mayor who actually involved in the project was sent to jail. So the project essentially aborted. There are other similar things. So political reasons and also decision makings that with no coordination among different agencies. So you see the land is controlled by land bureau. Planning is done by city planning bureau. They don't necessarily talk until the last minute. Do you see uh, improvement in that area? Yeah, there is a talk uh, about um, so the urban planning, kind of the central agency, is Ministry of Housing and Urban Rural Development. And then there is a land bureau. There is a talk of combining these two uh, bu uh, bureaus to make the um, urban development decision making process much more coordinated. Uh, I, I don't know enough about China's geography to uh, you know, make any speculations here, but I, I'm so aware of that initial image that you showed us with the 45 degree divide yeah. line between all this populated area and then this area and half of the country where there's like nothing. Right. Uh, how does all of that empty space there play into this? Uh, I mean, obviously the cities are where they are, but I, I mean, right. are we talking about like a, you know major natural resources that are out there that are used? Or so I, I'm assuming something is being used utilize out of all of that wilderness, if you will, to, to, to play into these projects? Um, so the population distribution historically, because this pattern showed up even in the early 1900s. So there's a lot, the reason is many geographic and natural conditions. Um, I used to have a map that dropped it. This area, topographically hilly and very steep slope. And this is all much more flat and then uh, agricultural land as one thing. And also there is a, um, the rainfall issue. There is a um, kind of a, I don't remember the, 
kind of a cascade or mountain range. Essentially, all the rainfall, annual precipitation, concentrated in this part of area. And this is very dry and harsh condition. And then if you look at the administrative map, you will see this is the Xinjiang, the, um, the, uh, the ethnic region. This is Tibet. Um, this is Inner Mongolia. So this is pretty much that area um, in that map shows very sparsely populated and a very poor natural condition. And this region really didn't develop until 1960s, 50s, as China's uh, kind of national defense frontier. And then government actually sent a lot of people there to build factories, build cities. Otherwise, it won't be developed like that. So political reasons why this part get built, then you still have uh, population. And now central government has this West movement campaign. It wants to attract people, population more inland to China uh, to kind of uh, address the regional inequality. But that program or campaign has not been very successful. Yeah. So I hope I answered that question. Yeah, so yes. On one of the last slides you put up, you showed abandoned echo city. Mm -hmm. What are the criteria for abandonment as a practical matter? What does that mean? Abandoned means it didn't move forward. There isn't no funding that city is secure to make the project move forward. Does that mean so, they just sort of given up on it? Yeah. Yeah. So the finance, I didn't have a chance to talk about that. So the, uh, uh, in, even including the urban re transit system, is the local government a bit, uh, kind of responsibility to secure finance. Uh, so they can get loans from government banks or commercial banks, or they can use land sale to generate uh, enough uh, finance um, to finance the project. A lot of those abandoned projects is either the land was not approved for development, or the city couldn't get enough money to make the project going. In, um, I just wonder if you could make a, a comparative comment. In this country, when, when, uh, when you talk about uh, environmental uh, development or uh, green planning, green cities, mm -hmm. um, there typically is a, uh, a political divide, if you will. You have one political party that is by and large for it, another that is, mm -hmm. that is against it. Uh, do, you, do you find a similar kind of divide in China? in China? Is there some resistance to this green movement? That actually, I, I think it's, I can actually say pretty confidently that doesn't exist, this divide. Because of the way how decision making, the top-down approach, that pretty much create a unified voice when it comes out. Like, this is the national strategy. This is wh where we want to go. But the, the eco-city, green urbanism approach is kind of a different because urban development and, and local planning is very decentralized. So you have pretty much the local government does their own thing. Some of their plans need to be approved by the state council, but mostly they, as if the, the general comprehensive plan or master plan is approved, they can pretty much just do their own thing. As long as they can justify what they're proposing to do is consistent is, with what's pro prescribed in the plan. So um, that's why you have eco-city projects that become controversial. Because in some cases, the government cannot convince the people that this is a really environmentally conscious project, as opposed to be a private profit-driven a project that's benefit the friends of the government of officials. So that's, that's when the controversial comes in. And, and you, don't, uh, you don't see uh, a, an organized effort on the part of uh, corporations in China to uh, resist this? 
um, if you talk about the development industry, like the real estate development industry, they are gradually become on board to think about green strategies. It's many of the competition in the market, they have to differentiate themselves. So there are several major developers in China now. They want to become the green leader in real estate development. They want to have their buildings certified as three stars, one, two stars. And then they want to, um, they, they, they like to label their project as eco-friendly, but with the government recognition now, they, they can show people I'm real. I'm not just talking, I'm giving myself a label. So I see in that part, that's really for their own economic interest they want to get on board. This is a bit far afield of your presentation because you, as you said, did not want to get to certain environmental issues explicitly here today. But you're, both, you're aware of this documentary that was uh, on the air in, in China over the course of the last couple of weeks okay. under the dome, right? Which the Chinese government allowed to be shown for about a week and a half and then pulled. Those of you who don't know what this was, it's actually a really thought broken documentary about the long term health impacts of air pollution in, in China. So, I guess my question to you is what do we think of that? Um, what do we think of the documentary being aired? What do we think of it being pulled in terms of Chinese government becoming more transparent about a solution problem? And there's a lot of um, kind of a, uh, speculation about why that happened this way. Um, you probably all know it's a, a self kind of finance documentary developed by this journalist. Um, she basically didn't put blame on the government. I think that's the first impression that people got. It's like, it's really bad, but government is doing things. Let's be patient. But I guess the, there's really, it, that has generated huge internet traffic. Like people are talking about uh, the documentary itself, talking about the journalist herself, like what's her purpose of doing this. And then I think that conversation gradually converged to people's fear about how bad the situation is. Like we just don't know um, this health impact and this long-term health, health uh, consequences. I think that might trigger government to realize, gee, this is not good. We can't let it stay there for long. That happens in China, like something just popped up for a short period of time, and then you, ha uh, you have access. But the government is really, really carefully monitoring what is being said, and at a certain point, they'll make decision. Yeah. That's unfortunately the case. Any other questions? Oh, I was um, you mentioned the expansion of the less topographically desirable areas of the West. Given the disjoint between the planning parties that you said for the green organization and just general development, community council, whatever, um, what are the odds that there's going to be very intensively green attempts to Western or to, to move to the West? Or is it just going to be the same old, same old built up and still environment? Yeah. I, I didn't show that. So actually, the Chinese government has now is developing a national land use plan. So it's a plan identify regions based on its ecological capacity and then its economic development potential. Actually, the region northeast, um, northwest, that area, also including Tibet, that area has been identified as ecologically sensitive area that the government has set boundary on what you can do there. So um, uh, that's a very political controversial step that government has taken um, to, to develop on a scientific basis, not political reasons, to identify regions that are suitable for development versus regions not suitable for development and needs protection. Uh, but the problem is a lot of the local governments in those regions, they want development because they want GDP growth, they want increase their revenue, they want to increase their quality of life. So it's, a, it's more kind of a competition of um, what government wants to do and what the local government wants to do. So the central government is considering revenue transfer, like um, the southeast part is 
heavily developed and will be developed as a priority development zone. And revenue gen generated that can be transferred back into the more inland area where development is prohibited. And use that as a way to address this inequality. 